my my dad, when he found out that I was going to interview you, he said, you, you know what you should do is wear some dirty clothes because you're interviewing the guy from Dirty Jobs. And I thought, um, dad, well, come on, man. No. That's why he's no longer the chief creative director of The Art of Charm. That's, that was the last straw. It's a bit too on the nose. Yeah, it's a little bit much. He's a Ford guy, by the way. He wanted to make sure that you're still driving that truck they gave you. For so, yeah, it's, it's 11 years old now. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought... got it as parked right downstairs. I'm no kidding. I haven't bought a car. I've never in my life bought um, a new car, ever. Really? And I haven't purchased a piece of clothing probably in all, at least 15 years, maybe more. Because you keep giving or getting things for free or because... No, I steal. You just I steal like them. From, shoplifting. From, uh, no, I would never do that, but there's sort of this unspoken thing on a... Uh, like on a commercial shoot, you know, they, they bring in wardrobe and nobody knows what you're going to wear, but I always wear the same crap. And, uh, you know, I put it on and they, they bring alternates and everything else and at the end of it, I just take them. And they, they don't care. They don't care. Yeah, they're so happy we had a good day. You know, to keep the clothes. So that's why I'm almost always dressed in an outfit that, that millions of people have seen me in. <laughs> almost always. And so, it's weird. That's why you're so recognizable. It's part of it. I, the same thing. I went without the hat today, though. Which is a bold departure, I think, for me. Well, we were going to bring you a hat, and we were like, oh, we forgot an Art of Charm hat. And then we thought, he's, gonna, he's got 150 hats. I don't, I, don't, I don't have any that say charm, though. That's right. Well, Tell we, me about your podcast. What, 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 what is this? What is the Art of Charm that you're looking to, uh, sure. to unlock? So essentially what we do on the show is we, we ask brilliant people such as yourself, uh -huh. interesting questions, mm -hmm. and try to make their wisdom available to everyone. Oh. So we've had people like Larry King talk about interesting conversations. We had uh, General McChrystal come on and talk about making tough decisions because he's made a lot of those. Yeah. Uh, General Hayden came on and talked about uh, some of the ethics involved in surveillance and mm -hmm. things like that and we've had body language experts and hostage negotiators come on and talk about negotiation and things like that so we thought that something that people can apply rather than just be quote unquote inspired because inspiration is kind of cheap it's more like you can do it but can you do it so you've redefined charm to include elements of uh challenge uh inspiration obviously uh but rooted in a broad-based level of overarching practicality Exactly. That's. I thought that's what I said five seconds ago. But you I did, but yeah. I, I just. You know? I, don't, I don't. I don't feel like you used any of those words. No, I didn't. I didn't really. I'm going to next time though. <laughs> okay. So when we edit that part out and then I say it again on camera, it's going to sound really good. It'll sound good, but it won't be charming. <sighs> See, what we just did was charming. What you just described would be polished, and in many ways, I believe the enemies of charm are deliberateness. In much the same way, I would argue that the enemies of authenticity are production. Yes. Right? We put barriers in front of that which we declare to be our objective. We do it all the time. We do it with everything, in my humble view. Yeah, I agree with that. We actually, we, when the show first started, it was about taking off the social mask, the representative that everyone meets when you first put yourself out there. And people were saying things like, when I was in law school, it was like, yo, in order to get a job, what you need to do is this, 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 and this yeah. in the interview. And I thought, well, wait, isn't that not going to work when I'm spending 25 hours a day with every single person in this office? Right. They're going to figure out pretty quick that me coming in dressed in a certain way, speaking a certain way with perfect eye contact and a firm handshake only lasted 40 minutes on a yeah. good day. It just proves you read the manual. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, which is maybe what they want when you're becoming an attorney. Yeah. Uh, Protocol. But not good for spending time in airport lounges with other people who are equally miserable. No, but there's, therein lies the dichotomy, right? You know, we, uh, this idea that if you're in compliance, then you're in good graces. It's True. sort of like with, um, uh, with OSHA, you know, with, with safety. The idea that if you're in compliance, you're out of danger, right? It's right. fundamentally uh, specious. Yeah. It's, it's not true. That organization must have multiple issues with what you've done over the past few years, I would imagine. We um, inspired what I called a, an army of angry acronyms um, left in the wake of, of dirty jobs. I mean, OSHA certainly fired off more than a few strongly worded memos. The EPA was constantly at high alert, angry, just angry. Um, uh, PETA was probably the, the biggest uh, source of uh, congenital... Um, 
a predictable rage. Uh, the Humane Society was right there. Even the FBI. I heard from the FBI on a couple occasions. What did they want? Well, it was a crime scene cleanup thing, and they just ah. they, they heard some things that. See, the thing is, today, as you know, the the interwebs they're they're populated almost entirely by uh, correctors. Right, the, the world is standing by now to tell you that you got it wrong. Sure. And thanks to, you know, our our devices, we can immediately find proof that we're right and the other person is wrong. Of course, they can find proof too because there's no end, right? There's just no end to the sources that can gainsay the other source. And so we've just become this extraordinarily uh, pedantic uh, people. And I think we've confused, listen to me, you didn't even ask me a question, but I'm just talking. No, that's okay. That's, I'm just here for you. You know what it is? It's charming. <laughs> we've, confused, we've confused noise and sound and argument with conversation and communication. We look at a lot, well, all of your Facebook posts and those letters and the videos that are done. And they're, at first it was like, wow, this Mike Rowe guy is really funny. And then it was like, wow, his fans are including us, even more ridiculous at some points. I mean, the letter you got from Fleet Week that was like, oh it's God. just annoying, I can't see the water on this day. And it's like, because yeah. there's a battleship in front of you full of yeah. veterans. You yeah. just came back from a war zone. Sorry. Yeah, you know, just kind of risking our life for you. Yeah. You know, that's all. I know it must be very annoying, very distracting. Yeah. Messing up your view. Sorry your dog gets scared when they do flyovers <laughs> at fighter jets from pilots that have been getting oh, shot at. Oh, God, people. It's just unreal. People, you just love them. I mean, look, it's, it, I mean, it's enough to make you crazy but the truth is you have to keep reminding yourself if everybody saw it your way i mean really whether it's politics or, or social or whatever it is if everybody agreed on everything uh what's a why get out of bed sure yeah i mean we'd be in north korea so basically you'd have to get out of bed for other reasons if you had a bed and it's cold up there it is it's cold and they all talk different they do they talk different <laughs> <laughs> That part, that part is definitely true. Yeah. Have Ten, you been to North Korea? I have. I've been there three, four times. Why? Uh, first time I went because I thought, this place is weird. I got to go check it out. This was probably ten, almost 10 years ago. The second time I went was because I talked about it on this show that we're doing right now. And people said, wait a minute, you can go check that place out? And I said, yeah, I can, we can go on tours and you can see it for yourself. So I brought a group of show fans and friends with me to North Korea. Talked about that on the show as well. And that filled up another trip and then another trip because I think it's an interest. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of uh, Kim. Of Kim. Yeah. And I, I probably should go one last time before we air that, that little slip up. But, <laughs> but when I go there, I bring people to talk and see the culture and engage with the people. Because as you might imagine, there's a lot of normal people there that live sure. in a regime that they know at some level is not working out for them. Yeah. And, uh, like and every level. At every level. At every single level. And they, they ask for things. When you go there, they ask for things like, hey, uh, that camera that you're using, how does it work? And you're explaining to them things like iPads, cameras, phones. Uh, they're looking at videos, and they, they can't believe it. And they've, they've heard of Facebook, but they've never seen it. And uh, every time we go there, the, the guides will say, do you have any games on this? Because mm. they maybe never played one before. Yeah. And so they'll, they'll sit there and play all day. You know, it's... It, I used to read all the time, like back in the 20s and 30s, um, accounts of uh, civilizations or, or tribes being discovered, you know, who had never seen anything, you know, post-industrial revolution. And obviously it's harder and harder to find that today. But I remember um, like 15 years ago, I was hiking from Cusco to Machu Picchu. Oh, my dad did that. It was a great hike. We were headed up to Titicaca, but along the way, we took this side hike and, um, you know, we hired some, they're not Sherpas over there, but we just hired some help. We had a ton of gear. Sure. And we, just, you know, we were lazy and we were just slumming it. And uh, these kids humped our crap for about four and a half days, and they were just amazing. I mean, they would run. They would sleep in. Like, we'd start around 7. They'd get up around 10 and pass us around 10.30 or 11 and then make our lunch by the time we got there. They, with all your, your stuff. With all our gear in sandals, running. I could still hear them running behind me. It was like, con permiso, con permiso. And they'd, and they'd run by. Anyway, um, we tipped them, obviously, but I had this old Walkman, this old Sony Walkman, and Soundgarden had just come oh, out. Oh, yeah. Right? Sure. So, Super Unknown, right? So right. My first album. 
And uh, I had been listening to that, and I, I put these headphones on this kid, and I said, hey, what do you think of this? Because he, he like, played the flute, you know, right, in, in the village. Thing. So it's the first time he ever heard an electric guitar. It's the first time he ever heard that big screeching tenor harmony. It's the first time he heard a drum kit like that. And you could just see his head exploding. I mean, it was just, it, it, it was, he couldn't have looked at me with more wonder had I pulled my own head off <laughs> and presented it to him while it was still talking. So I said, look, keep it, you know, just keep yeah. it. And, you know, and enjoy the album, enjoy the thing. But then when I left, I was like, oh, crap, what have I done? You know, like you the... polluted the... Well, it's like the prime directive on Star Trek, right. you know? You messed with something. And what, like, what happened when the batteries ran out? Or, like, is there, yeah. a, is there a giant monument now? There somewhere that looks like a Walkman. <laughs> the, you know, nineteen eighty nine first version one Sony Walkman with like the futuristic looking digital font on the front. Right, right. So like, you know, the 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 ultimate arbiter of knowledge is Chris Cornell. Right. You right. Know, we, we have to consult the uh, the Oracle, the records. Anyway, that's that's like the the Boy Scout rule is what take only pictures, leave only footprints, mm -hmm. and possibly a Walkman with a Soundgarden cassette in it. Take all you want, eat all you take. Yes. I, ten years ago, or over ten years ago now, I'm watching TV in my friend's basement where essentially I was living and studying for the bar exam. And I'm miserable as can be studying for the New York bar exam. And I see this guy sticking his hand deep inside some some animal. Mm. And I remember thinking, this is really cool. I, I, I wonder, I mean, how do I get that job? And at this point, you have your hand up a bull's ass, so I should have probably taken a cue about my career choices from mm -hmm. that, thinking, you know, doing the whole compare contrast back then, sure. in retrospect 2020 hindsight. Uh, and it seems like now that we've come full circle, AOC Art of Charm is very big on pushing outside the comfort zone, making sure that we are always pushing that bubble. And it, you've got that same thing as well. You've got this, uh, what's the word you use? The peripatia. Hmm. And aneurysis and peripatia. That's right. I only got the last part. Well, it's, you know, anagnoresis is a Greek word for discovery. Uh, peripatia is a, is a form of discovery. Aristotle basically argued that all insight comes through a series of discoveries. And great narratives are informed by anagnoreses that lead to a peripatia. And that's a discovery that changes the direction of the narrative. Right? So when Bruce Willis realizes at the end of the sixth sense that he's dead... That's a peripatia. Right. Right. Now, along the way, he has all these anagnoreses, but when he, when he makes that kind of realization, that's when the narrative of the story changes. That's when his life changes. You know, just like when Oedipus realizes, you know, he has an anagnoreses, Oedipus does, in Act Two, when he, when he meets this hot older chick, and they start to make love and fall in love, and then they have babies, you know, and then they're married. All anagnoreses. Act Five, he realizes the hot older chick is his mom. Oh, man. Peripatia. Right. <laughs> it changes the direction of the narrative. So mine would have been sitting in an office in Manhattan, checking for commas in an 800-page document and going, I wish I had my hand in a bull's butt somewhere like Mike Rowe. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, it, people would look at dirty jobs and, and find whatever they were seeking. Right. You know, you, yeah. could, you, you can look at that show, you can look at that segment and see a big cautionary tale. You know, and a lot of people did. A lot of people watched it with their kids to say, see, could be worse, could be that guy. But equally um, uh, passionate among the viewers were the people who watched and said, see, there's dignity in that. You know how important it is to put your hand up the bull's ass? It's kind of critical because that's where you insert the probe that stimulates the prostate that ultimately triggers the ejaculate, which allows you to artificially inseminate 100 cows. You take artificial insemination out of modern agriculture, and McDonald's isn't feeding billions and billions. Right, so sure. It's, it's not going to happen. So, you know, that show was a hot mess. It was a scatological romp. It was exploding toilets and misadventures and animal husbandry, but we were always able to find uh, a peripatetic moment, um, either for me. I mean, that was really my job. You know, I wasn't a host. I was more of this uh, an avatar, a guest. Sure. You know, and so... It, it was very, very liberating not to have to tell the viewer the truth of a thing, you know, not to be judged by one of the correctors we were talking about, but rather um, try it as an apprentice would on the first sure. day and 
do your best. Maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. What do you think when people say things like, oh, yeah, I watch your show with my kids so I can tell him what happens if he doesn't go to college? I mean, that at some point, if I were in your shoes then, I would, I would be annoyed by, by that. You can't, I mean, you can't afford to be. I mean, it, the Dirty Jobs, first and foremost, was an entertainment proposition. So when people stop me because they know me or they want to talk about the show, um, I, I've, I've never looked at them as, as fans. I've looked at them as my boss. You know, so like when your boss stops you, to talk about your work, you better freaking listen. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. may not like it, but you, you have to listen. You know, I used to tell this story in Newark. I got off a plane, I was walking through the terminal, and the first guy that stopped me, um, he was on a ladder up in the ceiling, you know, and he, and he came down from the ceiling and, and said, hey man, I just I gotta tell you, my wife and my kids and I, we watch your show, and it's just so great because I can, I can show them opportunities that they didn't know existed. And I can use what you're doing as proof positive that that opportunity's not dead. And then 15 feet later, a guy in a Brooks Brothers suit stopped me, Wall Street type. You know, he said, I know the type. Watch, watch your show with the wife and kids every Tuesday. It's so much fun. You're very funny. And I can point to my kid and say, see, see what happens if you don't go to college. <laughs> and so, look, in the end, uh, that's the, that show business. Yeah, it, it, it seems like... The, the boss analogy works great because, mm -hmm. in truth, if you treat fans like they owe you something, you won't have them for very long. Nobody likes a kiss ass. Right, and, you're, and then you're in trouble. Why are you always running towards the thing that makes you uncomfortable? I mean, that's, that's something you've mentioned in some of your posts and in some of the shows. Why is that sort of a personal motto? Well, it's not really, I mean, to be honest, in real life, you know, it, that doesn't inform my every position. Um, but... In TV, it does, because in TV, I believe, certainly in 2001, the Discovery Channel was completely reliant on a nonfiction model that elevated the host and the expert to a level of absolute primacy, right? So if you saw somebody on Discovery, it was because they knew what they were doing, they knew what they were talking about. It could, be, it could be Jacques Cousteau, it could be David Attenborough, it, you know, it, it, it didn't matter. But fundamentally, they were an arbiter of accuracy. Um, in the wake of that, my feeling was they had an opportunity to be an arbiter of, of authenticity. And it's a different model. It doesn't require a host, it requires a guest. It doesn't require an expert, it requires an apprentice. So the idea... Of, of saying, look, I want to do a show that fundamentally challenges the underlying perception you have of your own brand, that's a tough sell. But they, they gave it a try, to their credit, because Dirty Jobs is still fundamentally rooted in curiosity. So we were still satisfying curiosity, but I had assumed this different sort of mode, you know, this uh, the cipher of sorts. And that changed everything. It, did, ju it just means I didn't have to ever be right. Did you come up with those kind of rules for the creative process, or was that something where they were like, look, we need somebody who's going to do it this way, and you oh, just nailed it? Well, it certainly wasn't that. Um, and as much as I'd like to tell you that all this is the result of a well-executed <laughs> plan, um, I kind of forest gumped my way into it. I knew I didn't want to be held to the same standards as a host. And I had been freelancing as a host for 15 years before that here in San Francisco, Evening Magazine. You know, I mean, that, that's what I did for 10, 12 years. I would, you know, I would go out and I would host a show from a restaurant or a winery or someplace. And, you know, hosts and reporters, they're, they're with respect, you know, they're empty suits. Commodities, essentially, yeah. of talent. Well, we're interchangeable. I mean, why do you imagine the news looks the way it looks in every market? Why does FM radio sound the way it sounds in every market? market you know what so once you codify the system and then you start putting humans in it all they can really do to find certainty in their life is is something derivative they have to imitate something that they saw before that makes sense to their brain sure so pretty soon all the djs talk like this yeah yeah right i mean what what the hell is that why does that happen well as a host i was doing the same thing you know Hi, San Francisco, Mike Rowe here tonight on Evening Magazine. Blah, blah, blah. I listen to those old tapes. I'm like, Jesus, what were you doing? Yeah, a little painful. What are you doing? Why are you wearing makeup? Why do you look at a prompter and read it 
in an attempt to convince someone you're not reading it. You know, it's just yeah, it does make sense. Barriers it's to silly. authenticity, right? So anyway, all of that sort of informed the first episodes of Dirty Jobs. And once people started to watch it, it it became for sale. Why the emphasis on authenticity? I mean, this is something that we focus on at AOC all the time. It's all about authenticity, becoming more authentic, trying to ditch the performance aspect of things. Even the show that, that I do uh, all the time, the intro, nothing is, is got to be scripted because it just comes across as plastic. And people want to get to know, nowadays, people want to get to know you. It's not 1940 radio where you're a disembodied talking voice or a, or a TV host with uh, the Evening Magazine. It seems like you swam upstream in some ways trying to become authentic in a market that wasn't necessarily thinking that they wanted that at the time. Yeah, I did. But don't confuse it with, like, you know, bravery or foresight. I, I swam with the salmon. I was going to say you're the salmon of showbiz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, before Dirty Jobs, I was... I, I, I was right in the middle of the herd. You know, I was, it took me 15 years of, of sort of mastering um, my toolbox, you know, and, and understanding what worked and what could get me paid. Um, you know, I, I was basically paid to impersonate a host for 15 years, and I became um, facile at it. You know, I, I was never, um, you know, I was never properly acquisitive. I, I never wanted to be, like, I know Tom Bergeron, and, you know, Tom hit it big as a host. I never, you know, I, I went as far as I wanted to go as a host. Dick Clark hired me. I, I worked for a lot of guys. But to me, the, the most interesting thing, doing the traditional route, was to approach hosting and TV like a tradesman would a project. So short-term, small bites. Don't get stuck with a hit. God knows you don't want to hit. Then, then you're going to be... You know, you're just sucked in forever. Right. So, yeah, I, I felt really smart and clever for about 15 years working on jobs and projects that were so uh, doomed, so, so poorly conceived that no amount of luck or talent could possibly salvage them. I would attach myself to those projects, essentially like the Titanic looking for an iceberg, you know. And, um, and I knew they would fail, but I would do the best work I could. And so I never took heat for it. And in that way, I was able to work and take a lot of time off and, and feel all clever about it. Dirty Jobs was just a miscalculation. Right, you accidentally made something that people really liked that went on for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I made a deal with the network that allowed me to um, narrate their big tentpole shows, you know, like Planet Earth and big, big, big brand-friendly shows, and go on these various expeditions. And they said... Let's do something, you know, to introduce you to the viewer. And I pitched uh, what was at the time called Somebody's Got to Do It, which I did here in, in town. And they said, well, let's call it Dirty Jobs and see if anybody cares. And they had no idea anybody would watch. And they were horrified when they did, to tell you the truth. Why? For the same reason the GOP was horrified when Donald Trump was standing in the middle of that stage. For the same reason. Because there's a cognitive dissonance. And big brands hate that. So Discovery, in 2004, this show went on the air in 2003. It raided through the roof. They took it off. It was off-brand. It scared the heck out of them. And I went back to going to Alaska and Egypt and doing these other shows. But then, about eight months later, this you can't make this up, they hired, they had Steve Irwin, and they had the Mythbusters, and they had a bunch of new talent and a bunch of old talent, and they wanted to get a sense they had like 18 new shows in development. So they sent them all to Vegas and locked like 500 people in the room for a weekend and made them watch everything. Big focus group. Focus group. Ugh. Somebody, somebody at Discovery took an old episode of Dirty Jobs off the shelf and threw it in this pile of stuff. Really just as fodder, you know. The results after the focus group were, were deeply disturbing to people who were in the business of predicting results. Oh, right. Dirty Jobs was the, by far the number one show, and I was uh, rated very, very favorably as a host, which in my world is, you know, avatar, guest, that kind of thing. So that's, that's when they ordered the series. What were you thinking when they said, look, we want to do more Dirty Jobs? Were you elated or were you like, crap, I don't want to have to be stuck Both. doing this? 
it was very much a uh, careful what you wish for moment because remember my contract, you know, it just had three one hour versions of jobs and then all the other stuff that we really made the deal for, that's where the focus was. You know, dirty jobs happened because my mother called me here in San Francisco. She was in Baltimore and my granddad was um, 91 or 92 at the time. He was, oh, wow. he was dying. And this is a guy who could like build a house without a blueprint. You know, he was my inspiration as a kid and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. He only went to the seventh grade, but master uh, electrician, a plumber, steam fitter, pipe fitter, oh, welder, wow. mechanic, right? So he's dying, and she calls and says, Michael, it would be so nice if your grandfather uh, could turn on the TV before he, before he goes and see something that looks like work. <laughs> <laughs> to see you do something that looks like work. So that's why it started. And um, it was very personal. I was, I was doing jobs that I knew my, that would make my grandfather laugh. But, of course, that's exactly why it worked, because when it aired... People saw those jobs and said, oh, man, you should talk to my brother, sister, uncle, cousin, grandfather, dad, mom, right? And it just, just became very, very relatable overnight. And so when they ordered more, I was flattered that people would like it. But that show was hard, right? I mean, sure. you, you can't cheat on that show. On the, the big advantage I had was I didn't have to be competent and I didn't have to be correct, but I had to try which means, you know, you shoot from sun up to sundown, and sometimes you're swinging a mallet, and sometimes you're dangling from a bridge, and sometimes you're testing a shark suit, and, you know, sometimes you're making big rocks out of little rocks. You gotta be in it, otherwise, yeah, you just look like, uh, it's like Entertainment Tonight, where they're standing in front of the video playing behind them. You've gotta stand up on the wind power thing yeah. in the wind with the guy going, oh yeah, don't step back any further, and it's like, you should have maybe said that yeah. five steps ago. Yeah, you go in the hole. Yeah. You don't talk about what's at the bottom of the opal mine shaft. You go in the shaft. You know, you have to. You, you have to go to where the work is. And so that was the great trade and the, the, the beauty of Dirty Jobs. You know, I, I had one job to try, to try my best. And then right under that was say things that would amuse your best friend if you guys were watching this together. So most of what I said was an attempt to amuse myself, and most of what I did was an attempt to keep up. You're very anti-bromide, which is one of the reasons why I think it's, uh, as you would say, is, which is one of the reasons why I thought you were a really great fit for the show, because cliches and these little bits of advice and things like that are that are meaningless, in my opinion, are things you like to pick apart and that we like to pick apart and, and sort of shoot the platitude down, dissect the frog, and find out that it has no guts. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most common bromides that we hear, especially my generation in, in my field of, of with the entrepreneurship field or whatever, you hear these things like, follow your passion, follow your gut, follow your dreams, don't ever quit. I know that you don't agree with that as much as I also <laughs> don't agree with that. It's my pet peeve, essentially. Well, look, anytime conventional wisdom, anytime wisdom becomes conventional and then written, on a piece of parchment and then framed in some cheap mahogany and then hung in some godforsaken conference room, um, that's, that's where you've crossed over. You know, now you have a platitude, a bromide, a trope. And um, you know, it's, uh, people are so desperate to have a playbook that they gravitate toward one. But of course, it doesn't exist. And following your passion, we did a special on Dirty Jobs called The Dirty Truth where essentially I walked through an old office building and hung all of my least favorite bromides on the wall. And then, and then essentially, uh, you know, tore them apart one at a time using dirty jobbers as, as proof, you know, to contradict the conventional wisdom. Um, never follow your passion. Sorry, always follow your passion was the, was the first one I remember. There was a, it was like a rainbow and a flower or like maybe some butterflies and a waterfall in the back. I didn't know what the hell they're talking right. about. You know? Passionate waterfalls and butterflies. I don't know. But this idea, you know, whether it's in work or in, in romance, you know, the idea that your happiness is contingent upon finding the job that will make you happy, your dream job, for instance, uh, is not so different than finding the girl 
that will make you happy. You know, your soulmate. Right? Right. The one out of seven billion. Yeah, yeah, she's out there. Designed for you. She's out there. And if you're not really enjoying your life right now, you just you just have to find her. And it'll be okay. Right. You know, having a bad day at work, it's not you. you, you what, what you, you need your dream job. You know, so, so never ever give up on your passion. That's what we tell people. And look, there, there are times when it's excellent advice. There are times when it's the worst advice in the world. And that's why, you know, it becomes a sacred cow that's fun to push against. I remember, you know, American Idol has to be, you know, I, one of the most amazing shows ever. There, there's so much about it I hate. But one of the things about it that I loved was early in the season, you know, the early auditions where they go to a town. And, and thousands of people show up. Thousands of people show up following their passion. They've always wanted to be a singer, a pop star, and they're going to give it a shot. And um, it's not alarming that they can't sing. What's alarming is that they discover it so often for the very first time on national television. They're 20 years old. Their whole life they've been told, look, if you want it bad enough, it's going to work out. If you're passionate about it, it's going to work out. You're my precious little boy. You're going to be great. Go for it. Go get them. I just think um, it's a massive disservice uh, to tell people that the proximate cause of their vocational happiness is contingent upon their ability to never change course. I, I can't agree more. I mean, I think the fact that we are telling pe the young people this is especially alarming because when they get older, or when we get older, I shouldn't exempt myself from any of this, when we get older and we find out the hard way, depending on how, I guess, plastic you are with your, the, the ability to adapt to the truth, you can find yourself in a world of hurt. You can find yourself in a real world of hurt. Even if you're a good, hard worker and you can outwork people that are smarter than you, which was my competitive advantage growing up, essentially, you still find yourself swimming with sharks when you're a lawyer and you go, oh my God, not only do I not want this, but I worked so hard to get here, <laughs> and maybe your passion shifts. There were a lot of people in my class who thought, I want to be a lawyer for sure, and two years later, they're emailing me, hey, are you hiring? Yeah. Because this is terrible. So even when you get what you want, you're not always going to want your passion. There's a terrible um, inertia that, around passion, and, and really just around living. You know, way leads on to way, as Frost said. And I love that because it indicates a crooked road, you know. But this idea, you know, real inertia, that just pushes you further and further down the path that you're on. And so if you're not sure what you want to do with your life um, and you're 18 years old, well, you got a problem because society today is going to tell you you need to decide. And then they're going to say, well, you need to go to school. And then they're going to say, not just any school, you need to get a four-year degree. So you decide at 18 or 20 or whatever it was, I'm going to be a lawyer. Where'd you go? Well, actually, I went to undergrad at Michigan, and then I tried to get a job at Best Buy, and they, were, they said, no, you have to sell CDs. You can't, you can't build computers, even though I was building computers at the time for neighbors and friends. They said, you got to sell CDs first, and then you can move up later. And I thought, well, the answer to this is clearly more education. Yeah. So then I applied to law school, and I went to Michigan Law, and... I thought, I don't really want to be a lawyer, but more education is for sure the way to get around that. You know, I'll be able to do anything with this great law degree. What would it cost you? Uh, about, let's see, counting undergrad plus grad, at least $200,000. Minimum. So there it is. You're how old at this point when you get out of? Oh, uh, when I got out of law school, 26 years old, I graduated with a cr just soul-crushing amount of debt. This is what we're doing to our kids, man. And it, it, it kills me because... Why in the world would anybody ever be forced to decide what they have to do when they're 20 years old? It's, I'm still figuring it out. Yeah. And, and it's, it's just an unhealthy, unrealistic, unnecessary amount of pressure. That pressure becomes inertia because once you decide, then you declare a major, and now you've written the first check, and then the first semester is behind you, then the second. All right. So now, with every passing day, it's harder and harder to call an audible and go, you know something? Maybe I'm pissing up a rope here. Maybe this isn't for me. But no, 30 grand, 50 grand, 80 grand, 100, 120, 160, bang, 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 $200,000 in the hole looking for a job now, as you described, in a shark tank. Yeah. Now those jobs don't even exist anymore. They don't exist. But the real, the, the thing that kills me the most 
isn't the fact that, you know, people have to live with the consequences of their decision, but it's the money, it's the debt, and it's the pressure to borrow an unlimited amount of money. We, we're $1.3 trillion in the hole. $1.3 trillion. There is, by no metric anywhere that I've seen, a shortage of lawyers. But there are 5.8 million jobs right now that exist that people aren't trained for, that don't require four-year degrees, and they're, and they're sitting there. And so we're so completely out of whack with the opportunities we're encouraging and the opportunities that exist. Surprisingly, none of those 5.3 or 5.8 million jobs that exist, were none of those were discussed with us in our orientation at the university. No, because to our earlier point, those jobs are optically cautionary tales. You know, very, very few people, very few parents who didn't work in the skilled trades go to bed at night thinking, gosh, I, I sure hope Johnny turns out to be a plumber or a welder. They don't, they don't wish it for them. Guidance counselors don't wish it for them. We've got dozens of guys going through our program welding, making over 100 grand a year. It's just, you can't get their stories out. And when people read them, they don't believe them. And when they believe them, they still go, eh, that looks really hard. Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a mindset. It's societal, and it's systemic. So follow your passion. The word is on the street. The, the verdict of this, it seems like you're, you're just not a fan of that little dingleberry of well, faux advice. <laughs> thank you for that word, by the way. It's <laughs> got to get back in the lexicon. I and agree. You're on the art of charm. If we do nothing else but reintroduce <laughs> dingleberry into the vernacular, uh, you know, I think we can take some credit for that. Um, no, I would never simply go out and say, oh, passion is, is no good. You know, I would never say, don't follow your passion. What I said was, don't follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Because the truth is, why in the world would you want to do anything you weren't passionate about? See, on Dirty Jobs, we, example after example, this is the reverse commute. This is the salmon we're talking about. You know, the salmon aren't following their, their passion, although they are trying to spawn, I suppose, so you can make a case for it. But there's some passion involved. There, there's some passion. But when I, when I think about, you know, like the septic tank workers, um, I met, there was a guy in the first season, Les Swanson was his name, up in Wisconsin. He, uh, you know, I wound up in a tank with him, uh, one of these pumping stations on the side of the road, like up to our nipples in other people's filth, oh, man. knocking cholesterol off the side of the walls in about a 120 degree environment. It was, it was truly heinous. Yeah. <laughs> And I and I looked at him at one point and I said, Les, let me ask you something, man. What did you um, what did you do before this? How did this happen to you? And he said, I was a uh, I was a guidance counselor in high school, and then I was a psychologist. And wow. and I said, you've you've got to be kidding me. Why in the world? Wh why this? And without meaning, without missing a beat, he said. I got tired of dealing with other people's shit. <laughs> but, you know, aside from the obvious laugh line, the joke is really on um, the rest of us. Because, you know, back to his house at the end of the day, his summer house, sure, know, by the pool with the margarita machine and his two trucks and his five employees. And, you know, once again, a guy doing a thing most people don't want to do, creating not just a job for himself, but a business. And his whole rap to me was, look, I... This was never my wish fulfillment, but I got to a point where I said, what, let's just put the opportunity before what I want or what I even think I want. And look, there's a, again, I don't want to say it with certainty because then it will sound like a bromide, but the idea, when I say the reverse commute, what I mean is start with the opportunity, figure out how to be great at it, and then figure out how to love it. So the passion comes from becoming great at your craft. Yeah. yeah. Or deciding that you're going to love it. Look, I mean, I, I know that sounds glib, and this is a, this is a bit of a stretch, but wh why, why are the divorce rates among um, arranged marriages so much lower than in the West? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories about that, but I think the reason is because in cultures, well, one of the reasons is because in cultures where they have those arranged marriages, they're, they realize, look, this comes before the love part, and the love part comes into the marriage later, and we build that through hard work instead of just hoping that it falls from the sky from yeah. the ether. So that's, 
you know, I don't mean to say that anybody can marry anybody and live happily ever after. Chemistry matters. You know, that, that thing we call passion, that, that basic attraction, that basic willingness to do a job, that has to be there. But this idea that that person is responsible for your happiness or that that job is responsible for your, your success, that's a non-starter. It's a trap. You hit the the big time, if I can throw that word around there, relatively late for a lot of showbiz people. Were you This all hit off in, what, your early 40s, maybe? I was uh, 44 when Jobs actually went on the air in an yeah. aggressive way. And, and I assume that's not what you'd hope, not what you'd planned. We kind of touched on that. To what do you attribute that, if not, well, I'm following my passion, the TV thing, or were you doing just that and it happened to work out? Um, again, it, there is a real element of Forrest Gumpery Got it. in this, you know, but I had come to a point in my life where I was actually, um, my, my smugness with respect to my business plan regarding touching everything like it's hot, right? Like I was doing infomercials, a lot of them. I was doing guest spots on soap operas. I was, you know... Um, doing animated projects. I, it didn't matter. I didn't care what it was, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to know what it was. None of that was Germany. I just wanted to get paid and do good work and then forget about it. And um, the truth is that that can only last you back to passion. You know, it's just, I, I, I didn't have enough. My passion was in figuring out an overall lifestyle and congratulating myself for having five months off a year where I could do stuff I really cared about. The, the switch that flipped on dirty jobs just meant that there was no more time off. So now the thing I'm working on, it has to satisfy both um, a bank account and it has to satisfy my time, which is now completely consuming. And, and, and I have to love it, you know? So I, I didn't have to work hard to love it because there was enough contrariness in the show, like, you know, again, here I am, remember, back to the GOP and Discovery. I'm, I'm the guy at Discovery with the show that Discovery does not want you to like. <laughs> you know, in the same way the GOP is looking at those 17 people on stage going, yeah, look, we think we, this is the Jeb Bush show. We want you to like him, and maybe, maybe, maybe that guy over there, or maybe her, anybody but him, <laughs> not the guy in the middle. Dirty Jobs for the first season really was like that. And it was so much fun to go to work every day and know that I was in this, this place of, of real cognitive dissonance. It was a fun show to promote. It was a fun show to do. And it just gave me permission, really, to weigh in on any kind of work because we tried it all. So Dirty Jobs was the Donald Trump of Discovery Channel. <laughs> Oh, man, that your words, not mine. But it was one of the many... Look, and there have been others since. 32 shows have come out of Dirty Jobs. Like you could draw a straight line back to... The garbage pickers in the Alaska... Job, swamp people. Ice road truckers. All that stuff. Axemen. You know, th those were all segments on, on Dirty Jobs. Even Duck Dynasty. Yes. Yeah. Right? Now, now, Duck Dynasty, fundamentally different format. But all of a sudden, <laughs> Duck Dynasty shows up on A&E. No one knows. I mean, what? It was confusing enough with Dog the Bounty Hunter. Where's the art? Where's the entertainment? Right. Yeah, right. True. So, this uh, tension between uh, brand and program, and, and and brands who fall deeply in love with their own bromidal uh, uh, version of themselves, uh, always interest me because that's when they're most uh, well. It's when they're most vulnerable, you know. And so, the GOP knew exactly who their constituents were going to vote for, except they were totally wrong. And Discovery knew nobody would watch a show with a middle-aged smart aleck making poop jokes in a sewer. They were wrong. Whoops. Yeah. Oops. Now what? Better stick your hand up a cow's butt and yep. see what happens. Season 12. <laughs> Still reaching into mares. Species from every species. That's right. Bet. I made the mistake of watching the lamb testicles episode shortly before mm. prepping for this. Classic. And uh, yeah, it was one of the most memorable episodes, at least for me, mm -hmm. because it caused a visceral fetal position, a standing sort of, mm. 
I don't know what you would call convulsion, but not just one, not not repeated convulsion, just kind of a dry heave and you, then stay. You recoiled. I recoiled. Yeah. Well, it's 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 normal, you know. Uh, when any time someone removes uh, the testicles uh, from a creature with, you know, with their teeth. With testicles, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to, you know, you have to step back and take stock. It was that was probably one of the most important episodes we did. Why is that? Because it was my first attempt to do everything right. You know, I mean, I'd had this really passive-aggressive relationship with the network. They were getting flooded with complaints from OSHA and Humane Society and PETA. And we sort of had this detente, you know, and we're going to keep the show going, but I'm going to be a better team player. right? So I go in and I say, look, I want to do this story on uh, lambing. You know, and I want to do all the parts of lambing, and part of that's going to be castration. And, oh, um, and they said, well, what's that involve? And I said, well, let me tell you what I did. I called the Humane Society and PETA, and they both told me the same thing. They said the approved method of removing the testicles from a lamb is to take a, a rubber band and put it around its sack, thereby retarding the flow of blood to the testicles, and then it, they turn black over a couple days, and then they fall off. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, my God, really? And I'm like, that's, so that's the PETA proof way. And I'm like, yeah, that's the way we do it. And I said, okay. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, this is, you know, visually, th this will be good TV. It'll be <laughs> weird, but I, I've never put a rubber band on the testicles of anything. Uh, my species are <laughs> Sure any. you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so we get there, you know, and we... We basically get all the lambs together, and we, we start the process, and Albert, the rancher, he pulls out a knife, and he grabs the scrotum between his thumb and his finger, and he pulls it toward him, and he cuts the tip off the scrotum, and then he pushes it back, and these two pink thumbs emerge <laughs> from this fleshy sack, and he, before I could stop him or do anything, he just bends down. And he bites them, and he snaps his head back and rips them out by the root. Oh, here comes that singular yeah. <laughs> convulsion. No, but, look, but imagine me. I got three cameras rolling. Sure. And I'm standing here thinking, you know something? I <laughs> This is not what the Discovery Channel has in mind. So, uh, so I'm like, you know, okay, stop, Albert. Stop. You're, 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 you're doing this thing, right, that people do in reality TV. You're, you're trying to shock me. Hamming it up. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, you know, he was a great guy. Big old mustache, his wife. Melody, the two of them, they're just like, what are, you, um, what are you talking about? I'm like, you can't bite the balls off a sheep, dude. We're in a family show. We're in 220 countries. He goes, well, what do you want us to do? I'm like, use the rubber bands. He goes, oh, God, the rubber bands? I'm like, well, yeah, the rubber bands. I said, okay. So we put another sheep up there, and um, Melody you know, spreads the legs, and Albert goes in, puts on the rubber band with this special device that you know, widens it, and then you put them over the scrub. Oh, God, I can still see it in my head. Anyway, to put the lamb down, on the on the ground, and um, he looks at me exactly with the exact expression you would have if you were a lamb that had a very tight rubber band around oh, your nuts. Oh, you know, it's, it's troubling. And he staggers, takes a couple of steps away, and then stops and looks back at me over his shoulder. And then he walks to the corner of the pen, you know, makes a circle, and then just lies down and starts quivering. Aww. And I say to Albert, I'm like, Jesus, how long is this? Uh, how long is this going to go on? He said, He'll be in hell for about two and a half days. That's terrible. Meanwhile, the one he had just, you know, bit down on, yeah. prancing around, this is literally two minutes later, not a care in the world, no blood, you know, hanging out with his mom and trotting around. So that episode was important because right there on international television, we had proof that, you know, the business of being in compliance but not out of danger, the, the, all that stuff we were talking about before, right. there it is. I went to the expert. I was told precisely how this works, precisely what to do. And I was absolutely wrong. You know, the way Albert had been doing it for generations was kinder to the animal. It was more efficient in the field. You needed two people instead of three. There's a long list of logical reasons to bite the balls off sheep. It's actually more sanitary, too, if you can believe it. Because how, that, how can that be true? Because, dude, those testicles, they're in a thing called the scrotum. They've never been exposed oh, true. to the air. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. you don't linger down there. You get in, and, you, know, <laughs> you get in and you get out. You get in, you get out, poof, Bob's your uncle. So, anyway, you know, a peripatia. Yes. It was a peripatetic moment where you realize, you know, once again, everything I thought I knew about removing the nuts from a lamb was wrong. 
what else am I wrong about? And if you can ask yourself that question honestly, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to find answers. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. If biting the testicles off a lamb is wrong, I don't want to be right. <laughs> T-shirt. A T-shirt. A T-shirt or a hat or both, possibly. Uh, Why would you insist on doing the show in one take? Or is, that even, is that true? I heard you do it in one take. Yeah, I mean, we did look back specials where I was actually doing a version of raps, you know, um, and, and I would occasionally circle back and get those. And we, of course, we shot lots and lots of footage that was never used. Sure. So when you see outtakes at the end of the show, that's always what that is. But I insisted on, on two things. The first was never a second take because the second take, by definition, has to be a performance. Right, sure. It's you're just redoing something that happened, but yeah. tor- slightly to the left, right, or whatever. Yep. Uh, or you know, clean up your language. You stuttered a little bit there. Some bullcrap direction thing, right? That's the that's what TV does. Take two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen until somebody somewhere says, "Ah, it's perfect." Yeah, it's perfect, but it's a performance. So I wanted the show to be a love letter to take one. That was. That was the thing. And, you know, the argument was, well, what if we have a technical problem? What if a, a plane flies over? And I said, I don't, I don't care. So we got a thing called the Truth Cam, which was just an extra cameraman with a behind-the-scenes camera who always stayed wide. So if Doug's camera broke or Toy or, or, or Troy's or somebody somewhere had a problem, I could always turn to the Truth Cam, step out of the scene, and sort of narrate or chronicle the issue. Right. And so, you know, we didn't use it. In, in every scene, but we used it in every show. And toward toward the end, we used it, we relied upon it, because, you know, that camera proved, this was before you saw behind the scenes sure, stuff, sure. right? And so, so the second thing was tied to that. It was, I, I, I need the crew in the show. I need the crew in the show. And I don't, they don't need to be the same crew. It doesn't matter, but we're in the process of shooting a show, you know? And so to pretend that we're not, that's a, that's a fundamental fiction with the viewer. So right. the best way to make sure that take one is used is to uh, contemporaneously make sure the crew is allowed to be in the shot. And that way you don't, you don't have to say, ah, I got to shoot it again because I, you know, I got Troy's leg or I got you know, Jones's boom was in the shot. I don't right. care if his boom's in the shot. You know, we're in a sewer. We're up on the Mackinac Bridge, 600 feet up. You know, changing nuts. I mean, it's like the what matters. You know, what matters is the. It's not the shot. It's the work. Speaking of this, the sewer shot. When you're in the sewer in San Francisco on these, I don't know, these super old little brick, round tunnels, the episode with there's a rat that like crawls over your leg or something like that, and you just kind of <laughs> freak out a little bit. And I thought, why is it a stinking sewer rat that cracks the heretofore impenetrable? Mike Rovaneer of Cool. Um, you're talking about a scene that's cut into the open of the show. It goes by in about a second. The truth is, that episode was the first one we did. And, and that moment, that moment was, a, was, you know, that's something I talk about all the time around the country when, when people ask. My, my transformation, my peripatia from a host to a guest happened in the sewers of San Francisco. I was trying to host Evening Magazine down there, the very first episode of Somebody's Got to Do It, which became Dirty Jobs. That's me in the sewer trying to look to the camera and, and welcome the viewer into the sewer. But at every turn, I was thwarted. You know, I was thwarted by a lateral that exploded next to my head and covered my cameraman with, with, with crap and the side of my face. Oh, I was man. thwarted by roaches the size of my thumbs. Thousands, tens of thousands of them everywhere. And, uh, and, and, and the final moment, that rat appeared on my uh, shoulder. It was a big rat, man. It's like the size of a loaf of bread. Yeah, it was a big rat. It's a I'll big give rat. You that. And, it, and it, it, dove, you know, it dove off my shoulder into my, uh, into my lap. And I was wearing these, um, these thigh-high hip boots. And if you, if you squat down in thigh-high hip boots, they gap, right? Oh, so the man. rat goes into the gap. And starts burrowing in a southbound direction. Oh, man. I jump up, scream, hit my head on the ceiling. A shower of roaches comes down. I fall face forward into this fast-moving chocolate tide <laughs> of truly disappointing effluvium. And, uh, 
and, and, you know, face first in it. You know, I pushed myself up and I spit something out of my mouth. It never should have been in my mouth. And, uh, and I turned to the guy I was working with, Gene Cruz. And, uh, and he said in that moment, the thing that changed my career. He said, when you're done screwing around with the local wildlife, why don't you come over here and give me a hand? <laughs> and so that's what I did. Rather than host the show, we replaced rotten bricks in the sewers of San Francisco. I was watching that episode and another one on an airplane recently, and uh, this woman three rows or two rows behind me goes, yeah, I've seen this guy before. How does he keep his fingernails clean? <laughs> so the public's dying to know, how do you keep your fingernails clean? I mean, how do you go to dinner after that and go, man, I'm, am I hungry? <coughs> yeah, that's, um, you don't. <laughs> I mean, look, when, you're, when, when we were shooting that show, it, it really and truly was a, uh, it was a band of brothers kind of thing. We didn't go to nice places. <laughs> we stayed in Motel 6s. We stayed in Super 8s. We stayed in hotels with numbers in the title, you know. And I don't mean like, if you see a number in the title of a hotel. Like Four Seasons. Like, no, four <laughs> is cool if, they, if the number is spelled out. Right. F-O-U-R. Right. Great. But if it's the four, the number four, <laughs> no, don't go in there. You know, the Super 8, the Motel 6, the, you know, numbers for whatever reason don't scream, um, you know, five-star luxury, but I lived in a Super 8 and a Motel 6 for years shooting that show, and I can't tell you how many times, not to your point about dinner, but just, you know, you come back to the room and you just smell like ass, man, or, or, or something worse. Or worse. I would leave my clothes and my shoes in the tub. I would sign uh, a headshot and leave 20 bucks and a letter of apology for the maid because <laughs> I, I couldn't take them home. You know, there's no way I can take those things. Oh, you home. left them there for oh, disposal. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh man. No, that's what I was saying. I, I I haven't bought, I haven't bought clothes in 15 years. You know, I, I really haven't. They were all just, <laughs> it's just like skin, extra, extra skin, not my own. So if you're in a Motel Six and you saw a feces covered or worse covered pair of jeans and boots mm -hmm. and a headshot, and you're wondering who the Squiggly autograph was from. It was That's, me. It was Mike Rowe. It was me. The tasteful letter of apology to the maid. Oh, my gosh. Uh, celebrities get a lot of perks and, um, you know, free food, free travel, free clothing. Mm -hmm. A lot of my show's fans wanted to know what the biggest perk was. But I seem to recall you being granted some special VIP porta potty privileges on short notice. Are you talking about the show or are you talking about a very disappointing... <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. You yes. sick bastard. Why would you... I went for a jog back when I used to care about exercising. This was probably seven years ago. I left my apartment in Cow Hollow, and I jogged across the Golden Gate Bridge. Is this what, is this what you're talking this about? Is what, yeah, I wanted to just get a rare glimpse into the lives of the iconoclast with this one. So what happened for me was I, I jogged across the Golden Gate, and um, you know I had done my normal routine in the morning. I had a, a grande, you know, a, not a grande. What's the big one? The venti. Venti, yeah. I had a big Trenta. old... Yeah, I had as much coffee as you can sanely drink, and I had a big old breakfast. And I, for the past couple of days, had been um, not not struggling, but aware of uh, uh, some disappointment in my lower GI tract. Nothing that would preclude me from taking a jog, but I was aware of it. Anyway, uh, all went. It was a beautiful day. I jogged across the bridge. I was halfway back, and it felt like an ice pick was stabbed into my lower abdomen. And a couple steps later, I felt, I felt it again, and it knocked the wind out of me. And I, it, my, my, my knees buckled. And it was so horrible. You know, I, all I could think of was, God damn it, it's so, it all comes down to the O-ring, you know? It's like, like the, <laughs> the gasket. The, ga the dignity of the species, it all just comes down to your ability to control this tiny little sphincter. And I'm doing the math in my head, you know? At this point, I'm... I'm two miles from home, and the, it's like labor pains. The stabbing is now coming like every 90 seconds. So if I run seven miles an hour, I'm two miles away, ta -da, 20 minutes. You know, I'm just not liking any of the, I'm not liking any of the numbers, but I gotta get off the bridge because, you know, a B-list celebrity who soils himself on a national monument, that's the kind of, that's the kind of press you don't, right. yeah. you don't need. You don't recover from that too easily. I got off the bridge, I came around the, uh, down on the Presidio, and um, and I realize I'm not going to make it. I am not going to make it. I'm the ultimate humiliation is going to happen right there on Lombard, 
and I walked right around the corner on Scott. And I, I honestly don't know what I was going to do. I, I didn't know if I was just going to stand there quietly and grab my pants <laughs> or actually pull my pants down. And, and I didn't know what to do. Yeah. But it was, I mean, I'd lost my peripheral vision. I was hearing a buzzing in my ears. Oh, no. Like nothing mattered except, except keeping that damn O-ring closed. But like from Providence, you know, there was uh, three construction workers putting in, amazingly, a sewer line. And they had a porta potty next to them and it was locked because in san francisco you sure they locked the porta potty somebody will live in there yeah people are dying to get in those things so i said um case in points <laughs> i had done anything you know i didn't have any money on me or anything but i just said guys could i could i please get in here and the guy looked at me and said hey you're that guy yeah i'm like please move quickly he opened that thing i got in there and i mean it was as close as close can be but uh, it just sounded like Bastille Day, you know, and I, I came out and they were waiting for me with their cameras, you know, so three selfies with three sewage workers who, who really saved whatever dignity I have I've left at this point, but completely saved me. And three selfies is a small price to pay, I think. I paid anything. <laughs> Are you, are you okay with the fact that you're a role model to so many people? I mean, intentionally or unintentionally through Facebook, television? Doesn't matter. Has that changed your behavior at all in real life or online? Um, not my behavior, um, but it's changed my... Um, oh, I guess it has. I guess, yeah. You know, I mean, you, it's, um, it's odd because so much about Dirty Jobs was subversive. And, and so, you know, but that was 10 years ago. I'm not sure how funny it is for, you know, for me to be as silly and um, irreverent as I was, you know, I run a foundation now and I do some right. of the things now. So I, you know, I, I, I constantly, people don't really know exactly yet what the default position is for me. Like on this podcast I'm doing. Sure. Right. Uh, the way I heard it. I, I did one the other day on, um, <laughs> on the guy who invent a famous, I don't want to give it away. Right. But the guy who invented a famous food. And he was a preacher, a reverend, and his entire world was a rant against uh, masturbation. Ah, yes. Right. So I, I told the story of this man and the way his uh, beliefs informed his diet and the way his followers ultimately uh, adhered uh, to what it was he was getting at. But in the course of telling the story... You know, you have to say the word masturbate like 50 times. Right, and, sure. And, and I didn't want to do that because it's just... It's a little crass. Eh, well, you know, it's it's not crass. It's just the the problem is it's neither crass nor proper. It's clinical. It's sure, like, sure. So it's like testicles today make people weirder than balls. Right, right. Because yeah. it's like there's just something horrible about the, the specificity of it. So I just came up with, you know, every euphemism there was. You know, for corking your own bat or polishing the spear or burping the worm or whatever you call it, spilling your sin sauce, you know, there's a thousand of them. And these get peppered through the entire thing. Well, you know, my podcast is patterned after the late, great Paul Harvey, who would uh, really never talk about spilling one's heathen stew, right? And so um, <laughs> so I got a lot of calls from people going, hey, maybe, maybe, maybe not so much with the... Uh, you know, with the masturbating anymore. Really? I, we listened to that one several times. You would. Yeah, yeah, you got us, dirty, nailed us there. Dirty couple. And, uh, and she, would, she would pause and go, wait, okay, I get this one. What, is, what does this one mean? <laughs> I mean, we, we knew that they meant that, and I'm explaining the physics of, like, corking a bat, corking a bat for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. Look, this is, you know, my goal with that podcast, I have several, but, but bringing um, young lovers closer together uh, as they're, in, you know, their, their nuptials approach uh, through short stories uh, fraught with self-abuse. That's certainly an aspirational goal, a consummation devoutly to be wished. Top three purpose of the show for sure. Yeah, the, we'll link to the show in the show notes as well for people who are listening to this and want to listen to Mike Rose's podcast. But tell us about the foundation as well. Tell us what you're doing with that and why it's important, first of all. Um, it's called MicroWorks. It evolved out of Dirty Jobs in 2008, as you might recall, the con the economy kind of, you know, crapped the bed. I remember. I got laid off. Best thing that ever happened to me. That's why I'm go. doing this now. So, interesting. It, it, by, by 2009, uh, unemployment is 9, 10, 11 percent. 
all over the country. Every single day, that's the headline. Mm -hmm. Every single day, all these people can't find work, and the narrative became, uh, it's because opportunity's dead. On dirty jobs, everywhere I went, in every single state, um, I saw help wanted signs. You know, just everywhere. I mean, all 50 states. And I just started to feel like, you know, I think maybe, I think maybe there's another uh, narrative unfolding here that nobody writes about. And you don't have to dig far. Back in 2009, there were 2.3 million jobs that were wide open. And we had a skills gap. And um, it, it, it was an inconvenient truth for the prevailing narrative. Because how can opportunity be dead if companies can't find 2.3 million people to do the jobs they have? Clearly, opportunity is not dead. Something else is. So MicroWorks began as a, a, a PR campaign, really, to call attention to jobs that actually existed. And that's really all it was ever supposed to be, but then fans of the show started writing in uh, all these uh, apprenticeships and on-the-job training programs and things that existed in their state. So we built a trade resource center where anybody could go in 2009, 10, 11, and, and see what opportunities in their state exist that you're never gonna hear about or read about. And then we started awarding uh, work ethic scholarships to people who wanted to avail themselves to those opportunities. So I started putting the arm on big companies. I started selling crap out of my garage. Um, collectibles rare and precious. C-R-A-P, the acronym, of course. Or crap auctions, you know, kind of a, a throwback to my, my old QVC days. And, um, and we raised and gave away uh, close to $4 million so far. Oh, wow. In these work ethic scholarships. So it's a... Um, I mean, I hate to say legacy because it just sounds so precious, but it, it, MicroWorks evolved out of dirty jobs. Its main function today is to uh, provide work ethic scholarships and make as persuasive a case we can as we can for the jobs that actually exist. That's what we do. What kind of jobs exist that, that people weren't finding that seem to exist? Like welding and same sort of trades that we were discussing sure. before? You can start with welding. I mean, you know, I, I work with a school in uh, uh, southern Illinois called MTI. Um, they got a call from uh, Newport News, right? Ingersoll Ram, shipbuilders, you know. How many can you get us this month? Oh, wow. We got 50. How many do you need? 800. Oh, my goodness. So it's that. Yeah. It's all day long. All day long. If you're, it's not, we, we think about work and we think about jobs in this country like, you know, there are these static things that exist in a vacuum. Jobs might. But opportunity is not that. And so many of these jobs require you to do a couple of things that are really out of favor, like like retool, retrain, reboot, but mostly relocate. You know, it's not, they're not right there necessarily waiting for you. And it's really, you know, not to bash on millennials by any stretch because whatever bad thing you have to say about them, it's just simply a product of the people who raised them. Sure, you know? yeah, absolutely. Um, but this this idea that uh, the job of your dreams, first of all, the idea that it even exists is fascinating. The idea that it exists at a pay rate that will satisfy your lifestyle is doubly fascinating. And the idea that it will exist at a pay rate that satisfies your lifestyle in your current zip code is, is, is the height of madness. But that's what, you know... Right, so, so people expect a lot of the time. I run into it all the time. Yeah, look, this opportunity sounds great, but what do you want me to do? Move to North Dakota? Sure. Yeah, how soon can you get here? I got I got dozens of people who do it every month. You want me to go to the golf? Yeah. Yeah, that's where they're making $140 an hour right now, welding. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, you're going to have to go there. And here's the thing, it's hot. And it's hot. And it's cold up there. It's not, you know, we're not in San Francisco. This is not your... Right, yeah. Where it... Often is cold and hot at the same, sometimes <laughs> in the same day. Totally. So, you know, we, we call them work ethic scholarships because we make our applicants make a case for themselves. You know, you've got to make a video. You've got to write an essay. You've got to provide references. You've got to sign a sweat pledge. I wrote a sweat pledge, 12-point statement of belief one night after I uh, drank a bottle of wine. And, you know, if you're not willing to sign it, then it's entirely possible this pile of free money might not be for you. Before we wrap, Mike, I've got a story for you. The format may seem a little familiar. 
This is based on a letter from a fan of the show, one Mr. Matt Panisi, who found out through our boot camp, the school that we run in L.A., that I'd be interviewing you, and I thought you might appreciate this. The letter reads as follows. Dear Jordan, congrats on interviewing Mike Rowe. However, I've been harboring a secret vendetta against Mike Rowe for years. I think once you read this, you'll understand why. In fact, I'm quite interested in what he has to say for himself if you get a chance to tell him the following story. In the year 2010, I was the intended recipient of a pair of World Series Game 1 tickets, courtesy of the company for which I worked. Originally, my friend's father, one of the company's executives, had planned to go, but at the last minute, something came up and the tickets were once again available. I called my friend to see if he was up for the trip, if we could somehow play hooky from work and pull it off. But by the time I went to claim the tickets, I was informed they were already gone. After a bit of prying, my friend's father told me that he had given them to his friend Mike Rowe, who already lived in San Francisco. I, of course, objected on two counts. One, it was not made clear that the ticket lottery was open to anyone outside the company. And two, I'm sure if Mike Rowe wanted to go to the game, he could have gotten his own damn tickets. It's reasonable. It's important to note that I harbor no ill will toward Mike Rowe, and in fact... My wife and I only donate to the MicroWorks Foundation every year because it's the only organization we can both agree to give money to. Signed, Matt. But there's, a, there's more, also sure. from Matt. Hey, Jordan, quick update. Hope this makes it in time. First, I've called my father to get more details for you, and it seems that the story about Micro getting those World Series tickets is actually not true. <laughs> As it turns out, the tickets were actually given to the brother of the CEO. The reason he told everyone that he gave them to Mike Rowe is because everyone thinks so highly of Mike, nobody would be angry about him being the recipient of the tickets. In other words, the tickets were sniped, and he used Mike Rowe as a cover to make that happen. Sorry for the confusion. I guess you don't have a story from Mike Rowe after all, and I apologize for that, but oh contraire, Mr. Panisi. Because, Mike, as it turns out this time, you were recruited for one final dirty job, the filthiest of them all, serving as a scapegoat for a ticket hustle perpetrated by a mattress company executive, an executive who in a past life served in another highly esteemed position, mm. that of your college roommate, Mr. Mike Thompson. Anyway, that's the way I heard Good it. Good grief. Mike Thompson. Unbelievable. So wait a minute. Is that from? That, that's not from Mike Thompson. This is from Mike Thompson's kid's friend who happened to be a fan of The Art of Charm. And I said, I'm interviewing Mike Rowe. And he goes, I got a bone to pick with that guy. Good grief. That was a long run for a short slide, as yeah. we call it. <laughs> Mike Thompson's kid goes to uh, Bucknell, I think. And so his friend probably does, too. I don't know. But that's a, hard to know what to say to that, except last time I heard Mike Thompson's name, well, we, we, we talked a couple years ago. He reached out of the blue, but he was a guy. He used to work for Black & Decker in Baltimore, Maryland. And this guy, he was, he was, a, he was a freak of nature. He looked like he fell off a Wheaties box, and he also looked like every quarterback for every winning college team you've ever seen. And um, I, always, uh, I always looked at him with something akin to naked envy. I'm happy now he's in the mattress business. Good for you, Mike. <laughs> Mike, thanks for coming on. You're Appreciate welcome. It. Thank you.